Angeles National Forest today. Wow. Hero. Wow. Okay, I'll tell you the path, and no one cares, but I'll tell you. Of course, I'm really into David Politis and his missing 411, which is people who go missing in national parks for no reason. Boom. I knew that's why you wanted to do that. Absolutely. <laughs> so I've been reading about national parks, and then my. But it's not a national park. It's not a national park, it's a national forest. Neither is mine. Great. Another high five or what? One more. Okay, go. <sighs> yeah, that's good. That's good. When have you moved your arms? You like move your arms and stuff, right? I was told not to. Oh, okay, well. It shows. I have one really big arm, like Hellboy, <laughs> and one of them is just a string cheese, a melted string cheese. It drags. Like that pie you had, the mozzarella stick oh, pie. Oh, that's right. Oh, look at you doing callbacks yeah, and planting I plant, seeds. I planted the seed, much like the trees that grow in the national forests. Uh, mozzarella sticks grow in... <laughs> I got my information for three places. The National Park website or the National Forest website. I don't remember which one. And it's a two, cheaper domain. <laughs> <laughs> it's dot, it's dot, uh, dot tree. Yeah, dot tree. And two books. Angeles National Forest, which was published by the Big Santa Anita Historical Society. And The Forest and the People, the story of Angeles National Forest by W.W. W. Robinson. It's a little neat read from 1946. It's super cute. Let's it's so get cute. ready to wilderness. <laughs> <laughs> All right, shut up for a second. Shut up for 40 minutes, shut up, yeah. <laughs> shut up at your face for 40 minutes while I talk. Fasten your seatbelt. We're touching the edge of LA County, and in some cases, leaving the county. Uh, but this is a story I that didn't transcends... Take my passport. <laughs> this transcends territorial boundaries. We'll be talking about the wilderness. Angeles National Forest has been affectionately referred to as Los Angeles County's Backyard, which is my title. I forgot to title it. Uh, the County's Backyard. Because <laughs> it's where we leave all of our old cars. Exactly. That's where I can walk around without my shirt. I can pee there I can when pee the there. bathroom's full. <laughs> and sometimes I dug a hole to poo and then my dad got out of the bathroom. I didn't have to. <laughs> the forest takes up fully a fourth of the county. That's 690 acres. It, of course, crosses... 690? acres maybe miles um yeah, not miles definitely not, not acres. miles it's my not back, miles. my backyard is 690 acres it of course crosses counties and stretches from santa clarita to san bernardino officially it goes from san bernardino national forest on the east los padres national forest on the west the ranges of Pasadena, sierra madre and then reaches over behind los angeles to mojave around pyramid lake near the ridge Roo. eastward uh <laughs> the what the ridge Roo is what yeah. it says here eastward across the san gabriels to mount baldy so it's the san gabriels all the way leading right. mount baldy is the end of it mount baldy as it's known by its christian name mount Mount San Antonio is the highest peak in Angeles National Forest. Mount, don't talk about it. Mount, please don't bring it up. Mount Comover. Why is it called that? <laughs> Mount, it's that? very sensitive about it. Get it all out of your system. Mount Greg, they Mount, call it. Ooh. Ooh, Mount wearing a hat for a reason. Ooh. <laughs> Shut up. Mount hoping the snow cap comes early. <laughs> uh, I quit. I quit right now. I quit. I quit. I quit. I quit. I quit. Mount Baldy. You mean Mount? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, sits 10,064 feet above an area that is clearly not that high. Wow, 10,064 feet? Mm -hmm. Well, your acreage was wrong, so is that Maybe. right? It's actually no, 10 feet. But it feet. does snow up there. It, yeah, it's 10. Of course it, yeah. It's uh, an yeah. anthill. I'm making a mountain out of an anthill, quite literally. It seems that what is considered Angeles National Forest is broken into two, divided by Santa Clarita and, the, and mm -hmm. Highway 14. One side seems to end at Placerita Canyon and then pick back up at Bouquet Canyon and Castaic, going almost to Gorman. That's like another half of it, but I'm mostly going to concentrate on the side that we're on this side of the Highway 14. So let's talk about Angeles National Forest. The natural landscape offers so much to our area. It's used for mineral and timber resources. It's used for grazing. I'm going to read something straight from the National Park website. In drought-prone California, the quantity, quality, and timely provision of our water is dependent on the health of our national forests. The forests supply, filter, and regulate water from the upper watersheds and meadows. About 384,000 acre feet of water per year. That's 125 billion gallons come from Angeles National Forest based on a 2016 study. That equates to 180,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools and enough drinking water for California's population for more than 10 years or enough water for over 940,000 households for a year according to an information packet from the Forest Service. But we're going to use it for the Olympic swimming pools instead. Yeah, we're, we're probably going to use it to spray wet t-shirt contests. <laughs> That's where all the water's going. We're going to, we could have water for 10 years or make the world's biggest slip and slide. <laughs> it's a pop-up. The Angeles National Forest stores about 6.3 3 million metric tons of forced carbon. The economy of California is the fifth largest in the world, and California's national forests contribute to almost 2 billion annually in wages and income to small businesses, mm. about 8 million annually in labor income for wage earners and local businesses, which includes food and lodging services, arts and entertainment, and recreation, real estate, rental and leasing, and retail trade services. That's 1,600 jobs annually. That's all provided by the forests. The largest
sorts of jobs supported by the Angeles National Forest are forest service-led jobs, which provide important contribution to the local economies and enhance social connections and community cohesion. About 3.6 million people visit the Angeles National Forest to recreate annually, which represents an economic value of over $292 million to the state. Well, where does that money come from? Just like admission fees? Or? I think it's the, the park passes and stuff like mm. that from what park I Park hoppers? Park hopper passes <laughs> and also just supporting any local business right. that have to pay taxes and stuff like that. I've never been there, by the way. I've dipped a toe, but I <laughs> like after doing all this research, I'm like, they have that many legs. The Angeles National Forest landscape includes diverse recreation opportunities such as water recreation, which includes fishing, swimming, rafting, as well as camping, picnicking, and green open space for activities that <laughs> support human wellness and cultural traditions. Like recreating the Andy Griffith intro. Exactly. Getting to pretend to be Jason Voorhees for like an hour. <laughs> where are the cabins? Where are the girls? That's where the real money maker is. There's 126 lakes and ponds. Oh my God. 508 miles of rivers and streams. 541 miles of trails. There's six miles of wild and scenic rivers. 49 <laughs> developed campgrounds. 39 developed picnic areas. Over 1.6 million people visit the Angeles National Forest annually to hike and walk as their main activity. Um, and one buried treasure. <laughs> there are 12 threatened and endangered species that include the Santa and a sucker. <laughs> For obvious reasons, he's been conned out of existence. <laughs> you lent that much money to who? The California unarmored three-spined stickleback. Another one. I, I, I'm not. They should go. <laughs> it shouldn't be here. Say it to them. Say it to their face. How about that? And the very endangered California <laughs> about to die. The tickle death. Um, <laughs> the California red-legged frog. No reasons there. Mountain they're yellow red because legs. they're on fire. <laughs> the mountain yellow-legged frog because he's scared. The desert tortoise <laughs> and a plant called a Nevin's barberry. They're mm. endangered species of that region. There are many peaks and lakes and canyons, Mount Baldy, Mount Wilson, Mount Islip, Mount Lowe. There's Pyramid Lake, Elizabeth Lake, Crystal Lake, Lake Castaic. <laughs> Crystal uh, Lake. Oh, I know. Oh, don't worry. <laughs> There's jokes in here. Plant life is distributed accordingly because one side of the National Forest is coastal and one side is desert. So the desert side has Joshua trees and sycamore cotton and black oak and desert scrub and pinyon. The coastal side has Douglas fir and yellow pine and chaparral. Douglas and fir banks? De Douglas fir banks. Uh, maple trees, Humboldt lilies. You got bobcats, black bears, wood Peckers. Why did I separate that? Wood. <laughs> because you're obsessed peckers. with peckers. Woodpeckers, coyotes, red tailed hawks, horned owls, horny owls, pick me owls, hmm. newts, rattlesnakes, mountain lions, hmm. deers, I've raccoons. Got the woodpecker now. I tried going to the beginning of mountains, but I was reading a lot about faults and crusts, and it was only interesting because I was forcing it. Like, I was trying to pretend to be you, and I just couldn't do it. So it's not interesting at all. <laughs> you can Hey. We'll skip ahead to the humans. Let's talk about humans. According to the National Park website, radiocarbon dates of 76, 75, and 7,600 years before present BP, they found evidence of humans. Like, mm -hmm. they, they found, like, a cooking feature in one of the northern drainages of the San Gabriel Mountains. Early material culture indicates an extensive use of grinding implements. Stop. <laughs> to process small seeds <laughs> <Wouldn't look laughs> grinding <laughs> grinding implements process small seeds got some small <laughs> seeds for <laughs> <laughs> supplemented by hunting activities numerous cog stones are also found within sites of this period indicating ceremonial activities from what we know about the people who lived there in those mountains in the 18th century which were the Keech, the serrano the paiute and other tribes in the area they used the mountains and forests for everything obviously sure. you know that was everything to them they depended on the mountains for food for water for materials for their weapons they learned what leaves and berries were used for what medical ailments they tended it said to live in the lowlands and brush huts but some ventured into the mountaintops they said in the summertime but they made these annual trips sounds in the summer horrible. when is it the hottest yeah, yeah let's walk uphill <laughs> yeah that sounds good they would make these trips up into the mountain ranches to hunt animals like deer and mm -hmm. rabbit they went to the forest to collect acorns which were essential like we said before to everything everything and was I've acorns before i've had acorn mash it, it is good it, it and it was good. it tracks yeah, yeah. <laughs> they also gathered pine nuts they used chaparral for uh for a bunch of things they used man's Anita berries to chaparral or chaparral? Is it chaparral? Chaparral. So. Oh, that's right. Chaparral. That's what I kept Sh saying. Chaparral. They used chaparrones for a bunch of things. They used uh, manzanita for berries. Prom for <laughs> the <laughs> president's daughter. Uh, they used manzanita <laughs> berries to extract cider. And the leaves were smoked to look cool. Uh, mm. It's also said that manzanita leaves could help with bronchitis. Yucca fibers were used to make nets. Even back then, there were people were coming to the Los Angeles area <laughs> to fight bronchitis. Even back then, yucca fibers were used to make nets and ropes. The mountains and the forest provided the original people of Los Angeles with a, a abundance of necessities. Yucca trees were important. The tonyon plants were important. They existed like this for centuries. And then the Spanish <laughs> came. And we stopped seeing as <laughs> much... <laughs> <laughs> we stopped seeing as much native Angelinos in the mountains. They were relocated to Catholic prison work camps, or as one reading phrased it, incorporated into the mission community. <laughs> my, I have another, because I'm going to be talking about in my area the same thing, and they had another cute phrase oh, for it. Nice. <laughs> High five for cute phrases. 
for Let me, me try things. this again. Yeah, do it. Just do it. Oh, marinara. Wow, marinara. that one got hard. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it was marinara. <laughs> 1769. Gaspar de Portola. I you are going to start doing Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> How does an orphan? <laughs> yeah, whatever. You <laughs> haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. It's no, no I've, I saw it. I spent <laughs> no, a lot of money and no. I saw it. <laughs> Hamilton. I get it. <laughs> uh, yeah, clearly I get it. Portola and Pedro Fahis lead an expedition Hollywood style, traveling north from San Diego and ending up in San Fernando Valley. They were met with a friendly and eager to help Native Americans somewhere in New Hall, where the tribe fed them and offered them shelter. Not new information, but this is all happening right. with a yeah, region yeah. that's been become. You yeah. know, We're slowly and, seeing exact instances of contact throughout the city. Exactly. Yeah. Fahey's, uh took pretty good notes on everything and talks Who? about. Oh, Fahey. Fahey. I think we've talked about Fahey before. Yeah, Fahey. Pedro Fahey. Yeah, he was yeah. the second in command to Portola. He took notes on like everything. <laughs> He's one of those people. He's, He's like a Daniel. See, yeah. Oh, oh no! Oh, oh! Is that why? And you, I wrote that down. Really. <laughs> I remember better take notes. <laughs> is that what people think of me? <laughs> Note taken. He did pretty good notes on everything, like you, and talks about the high barren hills, which were difficult for beasts of burden, meaning mules and horses. But with the help of their new friends, mm. they were led into a small valley with a pleasant, sightly field full of trees and water. This was many trips Fahis would take around the mountain ranges over the years. In 1772, he came. Uh, 1772. Rep, 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 <laughs> <laughs> Learning can be fun, not on this podcast, but usually. <laughs> That's what this is missing. <laughs> Informative rap that white people can say. Boom. Ba, boom, 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 boom. My name boom. is Alexander ba, Hamilton. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to rhyme. Line, Show actually. close. Show close. <laughs> he wasn't assassinated before, but he was now. <laughs> Aaron Burr strikes again. <laughs> Hamilton canceled. Suddenly Aaron Burr's the hero? <laughs> <laughs> the guy reviewing his name is Aaron Burr. 1772, he came, Fahey came up from the San Bernardino Valley and crossed the mountains into the area of where the Cajon Pass is. So he was like making several trips into this ranges. He wandered into the Mojave Desert and Anno Valley. But other than exploring and understanding their surroundings, both the Spanish and the Californios to come, they didn't truly utilize the forest the way the Keech and other tribes had. They didn't really care. They used the water for streaming from the mountains, of course. Sometimes they used timber. <laughs> Netflix. I want you to know that I don't want to laugh at these things, <laughs> but like something in me, let I me guess that let me take note then. <laughs> I recognize a familiarity and I laugh. Uh, Do it again. <laughs> Do it again. Uh, Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they use the timber for lower canyon areas, but not really. Something that they did exploit though was grizzly bears. Oh no. <laughs> there used to be roaming grizzly bears in the Kazangaroos, and I get that they are really dangerous and they're the ones that kill people for fun. I get that. <laughs> Still, they're known for. That's what they're known for. But still, this story is really bummed me out. There used to be roaming grizzly bears in the San Gabriel's, mostly spotted to the lower part of Milliard Canyon or the Arroyo Seco and the area now covered by the waters at the back of Devil's Gate Dam. It was here that they were found, if not stalked, lassoed and captured when they were found and dragged to La Pueblo in the center of town near Bear Street. And the bears were thrown into something called a bear bull contest. Self-explanatory. But for those who don't want it to be true and are like, maybe it means this. Maybe it's a stock no, market thing. Maybe it's some kind of race. Nope. <laughs> they would throw a bear in a ring with bull. And the bear would go through a few bulls before the tables would turn. <laughs> this was something that happened all over California because the people of the old world were unforgivably awful. Uh, oh, did they get the bull? Uh, I guess bulls Where are. did they get the bull? <laughs> <laughs> I have one question. I was thinking bulls are native. <laughs> bulls are like the most common thing. That's not the... That's not the I was thinking like, well, those are only in Spain for the Toreadors. <laughs> a bullet claimed the last known grizzly bear in San Gabriel Mountains on May 16th, 1894. Hey, ironic that the bull got them at the end. Mm -hmm, it's true. What? <laughs> bull, bullet, bull. Is that what we were talking about? A yeah, bullet a fight? Bullet. Don't bring a bear to a uh, bullet fight? A female bull is a, a bullet. Yeah, a bull. <laughs> I shot a bullet at her. <laughs> Get her, get her, go, run, 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 run. <laughs> We've been feeding you gunpowder all day. Anyways, the man who, the uh, sorry, the asshole who shot the last grizzly <laughs> bear's name was Walter R. Richardson. Black bears did not exist naturally in San Gabriel Mountains, but in 1933, 11 black bears from the Yosemite Valley, they were up to no good. They were troublemakers, and they were moved to Southern California and released near Crystal Lake, which is above Azusa, <laughs> which is where Jason Voorhees drowned. All black bears in the San Gabriels are believed to be descended whoa, from whoa, this whoa. group. Not whoa, all not black all of them. Come on, hey, 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 now. All black bears in the San Gabriels are believed to be descended from from this group of 11 black huh. bears like that, the buffalo from catalina yeah these yeah, black bears are yeah. like you guys are trouble they should make them fight oh my god <laughs> inbred buffalo versus inbred, inbred black bear, bear. <laughs> i heard that they're trying to reintroduce grizzly bears i think to california like the grizzly bears that are in alaska or something okay. they're thinking of reintroducing them i can't remember if they're reintroducing them to yosemite or just to okay. colorado i'm not sure but but the grizzlies are coming back i'm sorry that all the grizzly bears are gone but i don't want but as soon as they're here i'm like 
you. Who's going to kill all these You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Can't we just put them on an island? I don't know. Let's just bring them all to Catalina. <laughs> Catalina's un- uninhabitable now. Black bears are relatively... What do you mean sh- now? Take that, Catalina. <laughs> You're going down, Catalina. Here's a side story, not to do with Angela Nass Forest, but I'll, I learned it this week and I forgot to tell you off. Like, one of my friends in my sign painting class, she grew up in uh, Palos Verdes, and she's like, oh yeah, I used to party with people from Catalina because we're pretty close. Hang out with this guy. His grandfather was William Wrigley. No, you did tell me this. I did tell you yeah, that. Yeah, you okay. told me. I did tell you that's that. It's weird. It is weird. And I think I asked, did he smell nice? You it was his breath it, fresh. When, yeah, I'll get a confirmation on that. Was his breath fresh when you obviously made out with him? <laughs> Since he was the grandson of William Wrigley, who, who can resist? Double the pleasure, double the, re- the not resistance. That didn't work out in my favor. Black bears are relatively shy and are almost never known Mm -hmm. to harm humans. Watch out for Walter Richardson, though. Those are the ones you got to look out for. (laughs) The quiet bears. But before we pass the early era of Los Angeles, it should be noted that the first American in Los Angeles appears in town in 1821, the same year Mexico conquers California. His name was Joseph Chapman. Here's Joseph Chapman's story. Have we talked about him before? Have we? I don't know. Maybe in passing. I would have remembered some of this, but maybe I forgot. We've done 65 episodes. I'm allowed to forget (laughs) a couple things. Uh, That's not in the contract, but okay. Chapman was the second officer on the Santa Rosa, which was one of the Hippolyte Bouchard's raiding ships. Bouchard was a French Argentine revolutionary. Secret blue. <laughs> Bouchard was a French Argentine revolutionary who led attacks on the California coast, primarily the missions, with his band of Argentinian pirates. I'm like, what? <laughs> pirates? He had, from Argentine, Argentina. Tina, uh, Argentina. Let me, let me ask my family who lives in, my very passionate family who lives in Argentina, <laughs> which is true, by the way. And Greg finds it hilarious that I have easygoing, passionate Argentinian relatives who make me seem like the most uptight white boy. <laughs> <laughs> Everything that I am, they make it all come out of me. You, you, you can't can- dance? <laughs> You can't tango in public. <laughs> Why not? Why not? The passion. I will literally send Daniel text that just the passion <laughs> out of nowhere for it no always reason. Always makes me feel just bad no. about who I am. <laughs> Why can't I be more like my South American family? I want to be loose and and passionate <laughs> and passionate. So wait a minute. So he was bringing pirates from Argentina to attack the missions in Los yeah, Angeles because he he was which just is something I've been waiting to ask you for sixty five. He was episodes. just striking Spanish stuff like the Spanish Empire, right. like anything they had on land, any ships. He was just attacking wow. all the Spanish stuff, which makes him kind of cool. But how is he an American? I don't understand. Not him. Oh. Second in command. Oh, okay, okay. So he was second in command, command to, the, to, this to the Argentinian guy. Yeah, pirate. Yeah, exactly. In 1817, we'll the get pirate. there. The pirate. The pirate. With passion. passion. <laughs> if you're going to raid, you do the passion. We do not raid them. We <laughs> ravish them. <laughs> we take the town and we make passion to it. We pillage. We pillage with passion. November 1818, Bouchard. There's another guy named Sir Peter Corney. <laughs> Who was Captain? Now Amy. that's my relative. <laughs> <laughs> Dance for us, Corny. I don't know how. Do I move my arms like this? No, please don't. He was the captain of the ship this time. His second in his command. Captain Corny. Captain Corny. He almost sounds like a, a serial pirate. You mean a serial box pirate? A serial box yeah. pirate. There's Captain Corny. He's commanding the ship for Bouchard. <laughs> and his sec- action nemesis, Captain Corny. <laughs> captain Corny. He's captain ship for Bouchard. So Bouchard is not there. That's a weird story. <laughs> but second in command to Captain Corny is Pirate Joe, Joe Chapman, and the rest of the pillaging pirates. I'm trying to separate Commander but- Cheesy. Commander Cheesy. Admiral Cheesy, sorry. And he just says puns. He says most of the things that you say. Um, you can write that down in your journal. <laughs> I take note. I take note of <laughs> The pirates are attacking the <laughs> passion question mark. They're attacking the Presidio at Monterey, and then they go on to attack the mission in Santa Barbara a month later. I don't know which raid. So it doesn't sound like they're exactly attacking Los Angeles, just because no, there's no. nothing really along the there's coast. There's nothing. Not at 1818, there's really right. not a lot to attack. Yeah. I mean, you're a couple of years away from Mexico taking over the missions and then breaking them up yeah. anyway. So, yeah. And we're, they're attacking coastal towns like Monterey and Santa yeah. Barbara, and then they go on to San Capistrano. So they, how are they going to get here? <laughs> they're going to take the 101? Oh, they attack Mission Santa Monica, Mission <laughs> Venice. <laughs> the Presidio of Marina del Rey. They went through raid. the canals. <laughs> now, I don't know which raid this happened in, but I do know that... Raid? Raid! I don't know what raid this happened in, but I do know that Mission Santa Barbara, the Padres and 150 trained Native American and scared away the Santa Rosa, the boat that he was on. So during one of these raids, Pirate Joe was captured by Don Antonio Lugo. It must have been a Mount Array. Yeah, Lugo, I remember, we've definitely talked about okay. Lugo. He took the blonde captive, who was Joseph Chapman, Pirate Joe, under his wing and brought him to Los Angeles on the promise that Chapman would supervise the Keech in the building of the church at La Plaza, possibly the same church that William Monet did repairs on like a century later. But Joseph Chapman, this old Yankee sailor, he was a gifted woodworker. He had practiced logging and carpentry in Maine. He knew how to make a tree fall in a direction he wanted, and people thought this was great. 
great because nobody had seen anything <laughs> like that before. He made good on his promise by using timbers hefted in the mountains of Arroyo Seco and carried to the plaza by the quiche and a bunch of oxen. Him and a bunch of Native American workers, they were working for a camp in Millard Falls when they were logging and, and sometimes they would get attacked by other tribes. But this lumberjack Joe, he was once a pirate, so he would fight back and defend the camp. Oh, and soon after this happened enough times, people regarded Pirate Joe, Pirate Joe Chapman, as a hero. <laughs> and when he returned from these logging jobs, Hero Joe. <laughs> hero Joe. And he returned from these logging jobs, people began to depend on his craftsmanship and he, from all this, became a model citizen. He went straight, like that scene in Butch Cassidy and the Sun Kids where they try to go straight. I, I Now I'm thinking of uh, the pirates of, because you're talking about pirates going straight and the pirates of Penzance and I don't know what that is. Uh, it's a music. It's kind of like Hamilton. I would say, <laughs> I am the very model of a modern major general. <laughs> Hamilton, 1974. Or, yeah, 1974. 1974. <laughs> we all know American history, right? The Godfather. <laughs> Aaron Burr. He shot my boy. Hamilton. You can't touch Aaron Burr. He's a made man. I might, I might be mixing nobody, movies. Nobody goes against the Constitution. <laughs> Anyways. And you come to this on the day of my Declaration of Independence. <laughs> Pirate Joe Chapman, Hero Joe, he was baptized and in 1822 married Senorita Guadalupe Ortega, whose family's ranch was near Santa Barbara, is said to have been burned down by his former pirate pals on their raids. Huh. Chappie, as I'm going to call him for the rest of this, also had valuable basic medical skills and successfully treated Governor Emanuel Victoria, who I had to look up because I forgot, one of the bad governors. Uh, Victoria was wounded in 1831 right. while fighting Californios at the Cahanga Pass, which I believe we discussed in Los Angeles year one episode. Mm. Anyways, Joe Chapman yeah. built a grist mill for yeah, the- what's it? Where, where, where's this going with the forest? That's where he did all this timbering. That's how he became a hero. They took him into the wilderness and he did all of the timbering for the almost the whole city at the time. You send a pirate into the forest, he comes back a hero <laughs> is what I'm trying to get at. All right? If a pirate falls in the forest, <laughs> does he yell R? No, he becomes a hero. He was like the- First American to settle here. Right, but he was like the woodsman, the if wood, you will. He was like a lumberjack and all for the that, city. And all that was coming, all that wood was coming from the- Miller Falls, which is in Angeles okay. National Forest. Interesting. Yeah. So cool. all the early buildings were built out of the Angeles National mm -hmm. Forest. Yeah, pretty much. pretty much, because all that's where all the timbers coming yeah. from. Anyways, he tried to get into wine and he failed. Um, <laughs> he moved to Santa Barbara in 1839. To some of the 19th century and the Angeles National Forest on the LA side, the Spanish and the Californians didn't really use the mountains other than lumber sometimes, eradicating all the grizzly bears they could find and using the water to wash blood off of their whips from unnecessarily punishing the Native Americans oh, they held captive. God. The chaparral. Say it again. Chaparral. Chaparral. I think it's chaparral. The chaparral that the key and other tribes had several uses for the Spanish didn't really think much of. They didn't like it. It wasn't good for pasture for cattle. Yeah, it's nothing. It's like it's like uh, it placeholders. Like, for but it's nothing for us, but it was everything to them. Right. Is what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. It's like when the Spanish came, they're like, "This is ugly. Yeah. I don't want this. I can't raise cattle here." The Mexicans conquered the Spanish for kill cattle. bears here. Uh, it's not a good setting to kill bears. I like it to be more dramatic. Big trees, you know, big trees. The Mexicans conquered the Spanish for California, and among other things, they also didn't venture into the mountains. The mission land was being subdivided when they took over. They turned it into ranches, and many of those ranches just light at the foot of the San Gabriels, but they didn't really venture into that. They did like a couple things. The Americans came in the 1850s as this was all theirs now. And at that point, the San Gabriel Mountains started to get more attention. But from who? Bandits, hunters, squatters, gold prospectors, Ooh. homesteaders. My kind of they, people. They're squatting up in them hills. <laughs> homesteaders and mountain squatters. Up there. <laughs> <laughs> homesteaders and mountain squatters also made their way into Los Angeles wilderness. Many of the canyons and roads and peaks are named after these American settlers. Miller's Canyon was named after a squatter. Rubio Canyon was named after Jesus Rubio. Rubio Maron, who took up a squatter's claim in a canyon near Altadena. Mount Islip is named after a settler on the west side of the San Gabriels. George Islip is his name. <laughs> Commodore Perry Switzer was a carpenter who ventured into the mountains and built a rough pack trail north of Pasadena. We now refer to that as Switzer's Trail, leading to Switzer's Falls. William Steertevent, he brought a pack train of burros to Southern California from Colorado, entering in the mountains on the northeasterly side by Aliso Canyon. Now Sturvent Trail and Campgrounds is a major area near Mount Wilson. This is a part of the city I have no right? familiarity with at it's, all. It's, like, oh yeah, Switzer Trail. I can't believe it. I, I would type in like Switzer Falls yeah. and it would show me like a little green area and say Switzer Falls and I would yeah. have to back up and be like, oh, that's above Azusa. Oh, that's yeah. above yeah. Altadena. Oh, that's like I... The Google Maps car should really drive up into those things. <laughs> you carry on your back. Google back. Oh, you don't like information? <laughs> I thought you wanted information forever and you don't want to put that on your back? Put over, the car on your back. <laughs> over on the Santa Clarita side of the mountains in Placerita Canyon near the far western edge, three miles from present day Newhall, a rancher falls asleep next to a tree. Oh God, here we go with this tree that again. That year is 1842 <laughs> and that man is Francisco Lopez. I, I can't hear about this He's tree sleeping. with the, the gold 
dust onion and behind it you or whatever. You are giving you're a spoiler alert. Okay, this is the week where we don't do spoilers. Endgame <laughs> is on upon us. He found the Avengers buried under the tree. He found all the Infinity Stones under this tree, and he put the gauntlet on, and he's got to dr- drop it into Mordor now. What? We both know that would work, unless Sauron gets the Infinity Stones. Imagine, oh, and oh then my he God, puts the ring on oh, the no, gauntlet. Stop it, so he's invisible. Cool! Oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to stop him? Nobody. Worm tongue. Worm tongue. The hero nobody expected. Worm tongue. His movie came out a month ago, and now he's the hero. Worm tongue. The first one's always bad, but by the third one, they get really good. Worm tongue's <laughs> trilogy. I knew him when he was grub tongue. Larva tongue. I'm trying not to laugh. I think. Take a note of that. <laughs> the liver puns with more passion. He's sleeping. And while he's sleeping, he's dreaming of floating along a river of gold okay there's gold up in them subconscious no big deal right <laughs> <Up in> that <laughs> id <laughs> no big deal i dream of copper all the time but lopez wakes up and he's hungry so he starts digging around looking for wild onions what does he find whenever i wake up from a nap i, I, I crave an onion i need a dirty dug up raw I onion want, i want to bite into a raw onion from the ground by the way this is probably why people hate the show but off topic completely did you know that at in and out you can get raw and grilled onions on the same hamburger really i didn't know that what's it called onions <laughs> saffron style yeah it's called give me my hamburger the way i want uh, here's my money do what i'm telling you to do <laughs> the guy offered it to me because he saw me struggling when he asked about onions wow he's not supposed to do that yeah he broke he's, protocol he, he went against the vow and then the other people pulled him back and put him in the potato <laughs> into the french fry slammer never seen again okay go on um did you know that at internet oh you said that already okay i, might, I got your paper sorry he was dreaming of internet <laughs> he looked up and there were two cross palm trees <laughs> he's looking around for wild onions right he had this dream He's hungry. He wants to pick wild onions. Wild. Oh, he does find wild onion, but it doesn't matter as much as the gold flakes cling to the root of this tree in wild onion. This was the first documented discovery of gold in California. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's gold up in them stories. Um, <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Listen. All right. New, this isn't for you. This is for the listener. Okay. I feel like we talk about this every episode. One episode before and you interrupted me at every because you heard me say placenta and we just went from there. <laughs> but I feel like we've talked about this before. I don't know. Who cares? I care. But <laughs> I could I'll, let me tell you who cares. Every single listener, all of the people who support all the minor forty niners, all my friends who are minor forty niners. <laughs> well, I don't know I'll do much about their stories. What's it like the radio show? No, it's a podcast. Dad. <laughs> my iPod's broken. <laughs> so Lopez brought his gold to Los Angeles to be appraised, and when he did, other prospectors began to get hungry for onions, and they <laughs> sensed the possibility of riches in the western soil. And the gosh darn California gold rush began in Santa Clarita, a full six years before it was discovered at Sutter's Mill. Right. San Fernando Placers, as the discovery was called, <laughs> was worked on and off for about a decade before moving on to other prospects. The tree still stands and is a national monument now. It's called the Oak of the Golden Dream, which you could visit today if you want to. It's not far from the city. I went there. It's pretty nice. Mm-hmm. This is the first documented discovery of gold. But stories about gold go back to the 1790s in this area. There are stories. Hamilton's time. There are stories that Padres and some Keech slaves from the San Fernando Mission worked a mine called Los Padres, which is supposed to be near a big bend section of the San Andreas Fault. But many think this is a fable. A lot of people like, I think we found it like over the years, but I didn't look into it that much because uh, Kern County, that's prison town. I don't do Kern County. The largest gold strike in the San Gabriels occurred in 1854 on the East Fork of San Gabriel River near Mount Baden-Powell. I'm such a city hick that I, I'm doing research and I'm continually <laughs> surprised that? by the amount of canyons and mountaintops. And also I read the word gulch. I'm like, there's a gulch in LA County? I, I want to go there. <laughs> there's one not on Gower? Oh, that's... Oh, Gower Gold! Gower. <laughs> Anyways, gold was found there, and a lot of it. This was the richest concentration of gold in the region was at East Fork area. People were finding nuggets of gold, not just flakes and onion roots, and that lasted for a long time. They were still finding gold up to the 1930s, and that's all good for prospectors and squatters and homesteaders, but I think you said something about bandits? 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 Can you tell me more about this bandits? The San Gabriels were a perfect place to hide out and get refuge after a job, so bad men like Jack Powers, Salmon Pico, Juan Flores could be found there, found, quotation marks. These bandits would drive stolen Stop saying bandits. 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 <laughs> These abandons would drive stolen cattle and horses into the canyons and pasture them in the flats. Pasture? Pasture. <laughs> I feel like we've discussed some criminals before who we've said like, mm-hmm. and then they ran off into the San Gabriels. Like, yeah. I think maybe Machine Gun Kelly or like there are a Probably, few people I yeah. think that it's a, it's it's a, a good place to disappear. Good, whenever I talk about the Black Dahlia, <laughs> I talk about they placed her in a certain place because in LA, you can be at the ocean or the mountains either way in theoretically 10 minutes. <laughs> when they talk about the mountains, we're talking about San Bernardino. We're right. talking about yeah, San Gabriel's and stuff like that. Yeah, that's the mountains that you could go and commit a crime in. Mount, Mount crime. crime. Mount Crime. There was a network of 
old Native American trails that could be used as a getaway if mm. any lawmen chased them in there and they had to flee. Our old handsome Robin Hood pal, Tiburcio Vasquez, and his pal. I think he's who I was thinking of. Yeah, yeah. maybe. His pal, Jose Gonzalez, would pasture the stock stolen in. Uh, pasture. In uh, the Chalayo Flats, which is above La Cañada, Gonzalez had a cabin in that area and said that one time he got into a brawl with a bear and he <laughs> only had a knife and what? he killed the bear. Well, that's like, uh, what's that movie? The Revenant. It's like The Revenant, yeah. except, yeah. I want to call it The Deliverance. The Deliverance. <laughs> Something else was killed up there. Man's spirit. A man's spirit to move on. One man's spirit. One, one, one man in particular one spirit. One piggish man's spirit. That's, God. Imagine getting Having into a, a knife fight with, with a, a bear. bear. <laughs> this was such a cool thing that it earned him the name Chilea. It means hot stuff in Spanish. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and hence Chileo Flats became the name of the area. But there's also another story that was named after a man who lived there for 40 years <laughs> named Chileo Silvius. How many bears did he kill? <laughs> the mountains and the forest there in the mining days are full of what are called colorful characters with great nicknames. That I did not have the time to look these people up because they had such small, minute stories and I already yeah. have nine pages. <laughs> so I'm just going to name them. Here we go. One-Eyed Mountain Charlie. <laughs> Twitch Lip Callie, <laughs> Peg Leg Bill Conyes, Old Man Armstrong, mm -hmm. Uncle Jimmy Grayson, Soldier Thompson, and Two Gun Don Rosencrantz. <laughs> <laughs> That's like three different worlds of people <laughs> that combined. His Majesty Bloody Knife <laughs> Manischewitz. <laughs> One of the baddest bad men of the San Gabriels was John Knox Portwood, who was a fugitive southerner from Virginia who moved to the East Fork. Whose in name is also a sentence. Thank you. He moved to the area in 1895. By the way, this is what they're in the gold rush and everyone's mining for everything and so there's just a bunch of people up there knox's canyon neighbors had always thought he was a bit shady and it didn't help that he was a wanted known killer he was boasting about people he killed and he had six notches carved on his gun in 1917 he shot and killed a man named herman miller after an argument in iron fork knox was arrested and went to trial and during trial he claimed that miller was a german spy that spy miller it was during world war one oh. you know history right <laughs> you've like watched hamilton huh? when hamilton defeated the <laughs> kaiser, kaiser. Wilhelm. <laughs> <laughs> so he was arrested he went to trial he was claiming that miller was a german spy that Miller's home in the canyon was a German communication line with Mexico. He said that he killed Miller in self-defense. Yeah, that's weird. Germany was trying to get Mexico to turn against the United States. Yeah, and Mexico was like, Never, mm. never, never, never. <laughs> Not we in a hundred years. They would never do anything against us. America, our greatest ally. Our greatest ally, where they're going to build a wall between us? Knox Portwood said he killed Miller in self-defense. The jury bought his story and acquitted him. Knox then sent threatening letters to another Kenyan resident named Blanche Cole because he didn't like her friendliness toward park rangers and government officials. Cole, who lived near Graveyard Canyon... <laughs> asked for the protection of two rangers as expected be, graveyard gulch would be better i kept reading this story and i had a like cemetery canyon cemetery huh. canyon i kept reading this and being like this is california right yeah i know this is south central <laughs> county right like this sounds like not blanche cole was worried so she had two park rangers posted on duty to protect her because this guy already writing letters known killer as expected knox soon rode up on horseback drunk and encountered the two rangers and he was ordered to step down but chose instead to draw his weapon and he was shot dead bullet hole in the head that entire story sounds like a Johnny Cash song. <laughs> What's crazy to me that there are so many stories coming from the San Gabriels and I almost fell into a hole and tried to read everything. It was once a booming mining town at the East Fork called Eldoradoville. There was another one called Prospect Bar and they were all hustle and bustle and then just bust became the, because they became <laughs> ghost towns. I don't know how much of these areas are left but there are remnants. There are mines and gulches and gold and badmen all in our backyard and I think that's so cool. Hmm. Let's get to the good stuff now. That's stuff that we actually showed up for. There were just outlaws and squatters out there but actual decent ranchers and cattlemen who were straight up exploiting its natural landscape of the, of the <laughs> decent people decent people just messing up they thought that everything was expendable and who cares ranchers were taking their sheep out to the fields and they were eating all the grass turning meadows into dirt some ranchers were deliberately setting fires because they were seeking more open grassland for the flocks these fires went unchecked for days <laughs> people were polluting the rivers and streams trees were being cut down indiscriminately to supply the boom in los angeles that they're going through in the 1880s a big help with getting the forest declared a national forest came from a familiar person in la history our old pal Abbott Kinney. Meeklings who remember from our Venice Beach episode, Abbott Kinney was the visionary behind the Venice Canals along with the boardwalk and an early pier. Yeah, I remember. You look like you wanted to say something. No, I was just thinking about the pirates going through the canals. But oh, okay. And I'm also thinking, what, is, what does he have to do with he that's where he tell he, me greg tell me greg please i don't know if it was during his whole pier thing or afterwards but he lived at the base of the san gabriel mountains he yeah, lived up there he, and then he had know, bronchitis or he whatever had bronchitis <laughs> bronchitis and when he came here he's like i want to get rid of my bronchitis kenny was an officer of the american forestry association and the chairman of california's first board of forestry which was established in 1885 kenny along with the activities board and with the help of renowned hobo and national parksman john Muir, who i think mm. is great all these guys were banding together at the same time so i'll go through that for those who don't 
don't know, John Mayer is the forefather of the national parks. With his writings that were published in magazines, this wilderness man led the California movement for the preservation and supervision of the forest and became hmm. a national movement to protect these parks. Now, Kinney became interested in the San Gabriel Mountains after he built a ranch home beneath the high San Gabriels. Do you know what that ranch was called? It's called the Venice Canal. No, it's called uh, Kinney Loa. Uh, that does sound familiar. Kinney Loa is said to be a combination of his surname and Loa, the Hawaiian word for mountain. Kinney Loa Ranch was sold to an oil company owner in 1928. It was eventually subdivided with Kinney's house torn down in the 40s, but the area later became like like Altadena Pasadena area. Kinney Loa Mesas, I think it's still called. Again, this whole part of the city, like all of you, none of this sounds familiar. I've never heard that's of any of these places That's what's before. crazy to me. Is usually <laughs> some stuff else sounds familiar, yeah. but like, have it Kinney had to do with the mountains? Like it's completely blindsided by it. Anyways, he was interested in the mountain ranges and the forest since he came to California in the 1880s. He studied many different aspects of landscape and how it was being compromised by the population boom. Unrestrained timbering and clearing, unlimited pasture by sheep and cattle. He also unlimited looked at Unlimited pasture. <laughs> he was also looking at the effects of fires and floods. He knew the importance of trees and bushes for holding rainwater. He was looking at how to protect soil. Overall, he saw what the San Gabriel's needed was. Yes, he was the only one thinking now about if we knock down all these trees, the next rain is going to cover the entire Higher. Los Angeles exactly. with mud. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He was Somebody was smart enough to think yeah. about, like, you know how there's that 10 years drought <laughs> and then we'd have a monster flood that would kill everyone? <laughs> how do we make it worse? How does, uh, look, at listen, everyone owns stuff. I don't own that much. Yeah. Landslide covers it all, like Fleetwood Mac says, and then <laughs> I own whatever's on top. Yeah, I built on top of that. I, built I paved the landslide. <laughs> <laughs> Overall, he saw the San Gabriel's needed was, as he said, intelligent supervision of the forest land and brush lands of California with a view to their preservation in such proportion to the other lands of the state as scientific forestry may demonstrate to be necessary to the welfare of the commonwealth. Basically, there are such positive effects of having this right here that if we start messing around with it and we start selling it and subdividing and knocking it down, that there's going to be negative effects on the island. They, they had the foresight to see that. And he had many supporters because many people understood that destroying the forest here in Southern California would have an obvious negative effect on the streams and water. That was the most important thing was protecting the watershed. We did a whole water episode, so we know that mm -hmm. we get a lot of natural water from San Gabriel's, from yeah. the high San Gabriel's. So destroying San Gabriel's would have yeah. completely altered that. So in 1891, the Department of Interior appointed Let's a- Let's cover it with lead. <laughs> <laughs> Can we make this mud out of asbestos instead? Yes. Let's plant asbestos trees. So in 1891, the Department of the Interior appointed a special agent named B.F. Allen to investigate timbered Best lands- Best friend Allen. Best friend Allen, B.F.F. Allen, <laughs> to investigate timbered lands and watersheds on the Pacific coast. He found in our area that we have a- There was poor watershed conditions and it had random fires, either man-made or not. They were having a tremendous effect on the area. By December, the LA Chamber of Commerce was pushing for the San Gabriel's to become preserved and to be made a public domain for the general public as a park, thanks to the work of John Muir. The following year, December 1892, the proclamation to create the San Gabriel Forest Reserve was sent to President Benjamin Harrison. Don't know that man. Benjamin Harrison. Harrison who signed it, which <laughs> meant it would be preserved and open to the public. The first name the area was given was San Gabriel Timberland Reserve. But in 1907, the word reserve I read was forbidden. I, it was probably just changed. <laughs> so they changed it to San Gabriel Natural Forest. And I can't find out why, but in July of 1908, the following year, it was finally changed to the Angeles National Forest. It wasn't the first national forest that goes to Yellowstone, but that was declared a national park in 1891, the same year as the San Gabriel. So it wasn't the first, but it was an early but edition. But it's the, it's really forest. confusing this whole national, because there's like six subdivisions of the National yeah, Parks Department. I kind of was peeking into that and I kind of gave up on yeah, it. I was it doesn't tired. make any, it's completely meaningless. Yeah, I... Let's just go home. Let's just forget it. Forget you it. know what? This is meaningless. This is Goodbye. meaningless. We weren't the first one. We were an early edition. But in 1915, Angeles National Forest was the first national forest to require campfire permits. So cool. there. Cool. Cool, man. Cool. <laughs> I like information too. B.F. Allen, the man who was set out to investigate the forest for preservation, became its first forest supervisor, followed by W.A. Border, Everett Thomas, Rushton Carlton, Theodore Lukens, William Mendelhall, Sim Jarvie, William Dresser, and George Roby. These are all, this is a long line of forest supervisors. They was just written in the book and I thought I'd write it down too. Forest supervisor commands the district ranger who gives instructions to lookouts, patrolmen, and guards. Their main concern, I believe even to this day, is fire safety. They're always mm -hmm. on lookouts, on rotation, looking for any signs of fire. I just thought that should be said. They're heroes. And I wish that I would have been that instead of this. <laughs> Up to the 1880s, everyone used the mountains for either sustenance or economic purposes. That includes the bad men. But in 1885, during one of the first LA booms, people started using the mountains for recreation. The 1985? No, 1885. Okay. Yeah, during the, the new wave boom. 1885? The pine, you know, there's no Back to the Future 3, right? I believe it did take place in 1885, but uh, is that in your notes? Did you talk about Back to the Future 3? And I talk about Jason Voorhees. What, what was our theme this month? We always have a secret theme and nobody knows about it. Yeah. If you say the theme out loud, <laughs> our couch starts what? dancing. There was a pioneer trailblazer in the San Gabriels, and his name was Benjamin Wilson, who was the owner of Rancho San Pascual. He also went by a name 
Don Benito, which is what the locals called him. He reworked an old Native American path with the help of his workers who are Mexican or Native American, and they blazed a trail up Little Santa Anita Canyon to the top of the mountain. We know it now as Mount Benny. Kidding, it's Mount Wilson. He built a little cabin along the way while working on the trail, and it was called the Halfway House. It was a three-room cabin, stable, blacksmith shop, and a chicken house. In 1889, a visitor named W.H. Pickering of Harvard spent a night up there, either at the Halfway House or atop Mount Wilson. I think atop Mount Wilson, but it, he went with his pal, Mr. Clark, who built telescopes. Hmm. They commented that the atmospheric conditions seemed favorable, and the two men hmm. made a decision that night to return with better <laughs> telescopic equipment. Let's build telescopes for chickens. <laughs> <laughs> See that? They're holding a chicken in place. Look at that. Yeah, like, Look at that. It looks like an egg, right? Look at that. Yeah, good chicken sound. Oh, oh that, that was, was pretty good. Oh my God, a chicken just walked in here. <laughs> Greg didn't make a noise. After three months, enough of their equipment had been carried to the top of Mount Wilson that they were able to build the first telescope and dome. And by May of that year, they were already doing space looking. They were later transferred their stuff to Peru. But just about 10 years later, 1903, 1904, another guy, George Hale, tested the conditions of the mountain top. Peru's a very passionate country, though. <laughs> How do you feel about astronomy? It's so vast. <laughs> Fastionate. Um, Planets. <laughs> the stars are so hot and spicy. <laughs> There's another guy after these two, Pickering and uh, Clark. George Hale went up there in 1903-94 and tested the conditions of the mountaintop for astronomy looking. And the Carnegie Institution of Washington, D.C. granted him funds to build another telescope and construct an observatory. That's the story of the Mount huh. Wilson Observatory. Interesting. Thanks to Don Benito. <laughs> Here's to you, Don, Don Benito. Benito. <laughs> because of pals like Benny Wilson, Don Benito, people went up to San Gabriel's to hike because of the trails he built hunting and fishing were super popular in ranges recreation became so popular that in 1894 pacific electric had a funicular going up mount low mm. and taking people to the echo right. mountain house which we talked about in the red car yellow card yeah. episode mount low scenic railway was created by thaddeus slow and david mcpherson and it was world famous it was a tourist stop for thousands of visitors there was three hotels up there on mount low which were that was 3300 feet up in the san gabriel's how many 3300 one three-day weekend the echo mountain house and the path saw 5,000 visitors which was a Bunch. For those days. For those days, yeah. And, there was and, only 300 remember, people in the world. <laughs> they, a few of them came twice. <laughs> there was also, I remember that, like, there was like a spotlight up there, mm -hmm. and you can pay, like, on your birthday, we'll shine the spotlight yeah, on your house. So cool. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> and it melts your house. Yeah. Anyways, it burned down 1936. Fire purifies all. <laughs> What's called the Great Hiking Area lasted from 1895 to 1938, and the Angeles National Forest had a lot to do with that. People were coming to, because of the land boom, were coming. Right. People like Charles Loomis and Land of Sunshine were promoting that. John Muir had been writing about it. It was now National Forest. So people who are really using this area. Mm -hmm. And chronologically, I feel like it's a good time to mention a weird thing. Now that I am c close to closing this up. So it's 1936 in the East Fork of the San Gabriel River. Remember, that's where, that's the largest concentration of gold was discovered there. There's gold up in them fork. <laughs> a bridge was built. It uh -huh. was meant to serve as a link between San Gabriel Valley to the south and Wrightwood to the north. Well, wouldn't you know it? But a dang flood come in 1938 mm -hmm. and changed the natural landscape and washed away the road, which was meant to be to meet <laughs> the bridge. Imagine. Well, we finally got the funding. We're imagine, halfway done. Imagine coming out with like a pick and a shovel. You're face to face with a new mountain. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. San Gabriel, I got news about this bridge. The road was never restored and construction was abandoned due to lack of financial investment because they, they didn't want to spend all this money digging up a hill. But the bridge remained isolated deep in the San Gabriel Mountains. One side of the bridge is normal. It's wide and stuff. And the other it just ends at the bottom of this hill and dies off. So it's, this was just like a big flood. That, or yeah, something. yeah, it was the flood of 1938. Right. The yeah. one that uh, Woody Guthrie wrote about. I think it's whatever. the one that Woody Guthrie wrote about. <laughs> uh, although this was it. I think in March and that was on New Year's Day but oh, yeah, I'm wondering yeah, which yeah. one it's messed up a, it's a sequel song it's the let's twist again we this is called the bridge to nowhere and it's become a must see for hikers willing to hike four hours to get there it might be four hours there and back but I don't know but I showed Ada and she's like no yeah. we're not doing that people also bungee jump off the side of it my friend Nikesh did it he bungee jumped off the side of that the bridge is also a 1930s the bungee jump to nowhere <laughs> the bridge is also a 1930s bridge so it's dramatic ass how this is in the, the hills north of Azusa if you get curious you can look up bridge to nowhere it's pretty neat by the way like we were talking about the 1930 flood is the big one it's the one that we talked about several times it was catastrophic overnight trails and camps and cabins in San Gabriel's were wiped out it was the fury of the floods and the oh, fire out. You like that. <laughs> <laughs> it was familiar and you liked it, didn't you? You liked hearing it. Does it remind you of a thing, didn't it? Yes. Brought yes. back memory. Yes. Yes. I like yes. It. I like limited it. references. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's ever really forgotten. <laughs> there were a lot of floods and there were a whole lot of fires. And that truly did away with the Great Hiking Era. It was easier to just enjoy the Great Depression, <laughs> you know, than to go hiking, which was, you know, a free thing. There's been too many fires to list, but just know. Can't afford the trail mix. There was too many fires to list, but just know that 
Station Fire in 2009 happened above La Cañada in the Nash Angeles Forest, right. and that was considered to be one of the worst forest fires ever up till 2018, when we had like mm -hmm. all of the worst forest oh, fires ever. I'll be talking ever. about that. High five on that. Let me try this again. Yeah, ready? Boom! <laughs> <laughs> Immediately EMT are here. Are you okay? <laughs> we heard a big high five. <laughs> this was a high 10. Everybody who listens to the podcast, ears, eardrum explodes. The podcast, I'll have you staring. Oh, I gotta go to the hospital. A lot of water is scary, but also no water is just as bad. 18 million trees have died in California since the fall of Ooh. 2017. Ooh, even as the state. What? Yeah. Wow. Because of the climate change. Wow. Which isn't real. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. I didn't have to worry about that. Even as the state emerged from a years long drought, you know, the rain season this year has helped some, but we aren't out of the trenches yet like so we're still obviously in trouble the entire angeles national forest continues to be a popular destination for tourists and residents more with tourists than residents we get millions of people coming every year for different kinds of things to go hiking to go camping to dump their bodies recreation stuff with social media hiking has become way more popular not because of the bonding experience between you and nature but because you get all the best shots <laughs> the bonding experience between you and instagram <laughs> between you and all your friends on instagram you never met this beautiful natural landscape with a rich history is in our backyard and i encourage everyone this spring to go out there in the trails and canyons and lakes and see what kind of high strangers you get yourself into. <laughs> Mothman, Flatwoods Monster, you're going to see a chupacabra, a Jersey Devil, Bigfoot. <laughs> Report back to us. You'll see a raccoon riding chupacabra. <laughs> if you're going, look into something called an adventure pass. It's a, either the camp or to park probably boat. It's the pass to get in. You can purchase a national forest adventure pass for there's a day one for $5 or an annual $30 one, which is not a bad deal. You can get those at the, in Arcadia, they have the national forest headquarters or you can go to like REI or Big Five, they sell it. And that money goes towards park projects and repairs. Earlier this year, there was a government shutdown, as we all know, which meant that it was open season on punishing the <laughs> national parks, but there was no reports <laughs> of damage, really, in National National Finally. Park. Finally. <laughs> oh, I've been waiting to hit a Joshua Tree. Joshua Tree got the brunt of most of the attack from because idiots. Because everyone pooed on it or whatever. They were, like, chopping down Joshua Tree arms and stuff. They were all on peyote. That's what Joshua Tree it is. It doesn't make you violent. It might actually. Well, it does make you poo. It does well, make you ayahuasca. poo. ayahuasca. I like you keep track. Of, you'll never do drugs, but you keep track of what Which drugs make, make you, you poo. poo. <laughs> yeah. So that's been Angela National Forest. Please go out there. So you have to pay to get in, like a, like. A, I think so. Either pay like to chump. get. You either pay to get in, or you pay to like to park and camp and stuff. Okay. Yeah, I was looking into it, but it's very weird online. It's, a little it's research. It's kind of confusing because now I know national parks you have to pay to get yeah. in. Although when we were at Rocky Mountain, we're like, well, here we go. We have to pay fifteen dollars. Then we got there and like all the rain stations were abandoned oh we're wow like, well, that's a good sign we get to go in for free blood claw marks <laughs> everywhere <laughs> there's this guy sleeping on the ground uh, i don't know what they, i think he lost so much blood he went to sleep